So I just have to make one slight co uh, correction. Um, this is a series of graphic novels uh, or graphic histories, and I'm in the fifth issue, and I brought the first. So this is just the history at the beginning. Um, I also, you'll have to get these trading cards, Life uh, in the Extremes. So collect them all. We have halophiles, zero files, any file you would like, right here. So they're up on the table at the front there. So thank you very much for uh, inviting me and giving me the, this opportunity both to witness firsthand all the work that's being done by JGI researchers um, and collaborators. Um, it, what The work that you do is very important to the astrobiology program and NASA because we're interested in um, understanding uh, the diversity of life on Earth. We're interested in understanding what sort of genomic evolutionary traits um, have evolved to ad allow organisms to adapt to various environments, particularly extreme environments, or at least extreme to us, uh, and also how organisms interact with each other and what kind of potentially novel metabolisms you can observe. So this meeting is right in uh, our wheelhouse and our interest. So I'm, I'm no longer a scientist to some. I'm a manager um, or a bureaucrat. And so I'm going to mostly be talking very broadly about the sort of research that we do and to get you thinking uh, about other extreme environments besides those on Earth. So just as a, a quick overview, I'm the head of the astrobiology program. We're interested in understanding how we got here, uh, where we're going, so the future of life on Earth. And are we alone, or is there anyone else out there? Uh, and we uh, focus on, um, uh, and, and the name astrobiology just uh, refers to the fact that we need to know everything about uh, the beginning of our solar system, so star stuff, to life, and all, all steps in between, in term, including the evolution of habitable environments. Um, so we focus on uh, studying the Earth and everything that we can find out about the Earth and its biosphere and the interaction between the organisms as they evolved and what was happening on our planet. And then we look to space and under to understand about it, potential environments out there that could harbor life. It's inherently interdisciplinary. I started to mention we have people that look at protoplanetary disk, which is the materials that are planetary system, solar system came out of, um, people who are, do biology, geology, chemistry, planetary sciences. It's all necessary to answer this, um, these, these major important questions. In general, I just want to point out uh, generally what NASA's interests are in omics. So I already mentioned astrobiology. We're interested in environment-dependent molecular evolution in microorganisms, the coevolution of microbial communities and how um, their interaction with the environment, as I mentioned before, affects that, and biochemical adaptations to extreme environments. In addition to my program, which is in the Science Mission Directorate and is involved in most of the missions you'll hear about, robotic missions you'll hear, uh, exploring our solar system and beyond, we also have space biology, which is much more, uh, is related to the human exploration program, and they're interested in understanding biological effects that are important to human exploration. And I believe there was a poster uh, by Wayne um, Nichols uh, earlier, the, the, this, or earlier, how was that, yesterday, <laughs> or maybe it was Tuesday night. Um, and so they're looking at sort of the effect of microbiomes that are hosted by astronauts. You heard something about that from Chris Mason last night. Um, also, their environment, so what's going on on the International Space Station, for example. And they're interested in developing um, or under, an understanding about the potential role microbes could play in reducing engineering risks. And specifically, it's related to synthetic biology. And we're looking at ways that microbes can be used to, um, do, use, to do in, -source resource, in situ resource utilization, biomembrane-based filters. We're looking at food production, life support, production and purification of uh, on-demand pharmaceuticals, and so we're always thinking about what's the uh, a light, weight, energy efficient way to, to actually bring stuff into space without loading up a giant, you know, we're not going to be able to send um, containers full of materials, and can microbes take advantage of what's out there and do things for us? Um, so that's more generically what we're interested in. That isn't the part of NASA that I work for. Um, I'm going to get back to astrobiology and I think things that are um, well, I, I mentioned these programs in space biology because I think people that are in the room would be interested in applying. I'm going to talk a little bit more about experiments that we have 
uh, funded and ongoing in the International Space Station, and those are opportunities that I don't uh, participate in but are available to anyone who might be interested. So why does NASA study extremophiles on Earth? We're interested in high temperature, low temperature extremes. Um, we're interested in low ac water activity, so zero files. We're interested in high acidity or, or low, um, so low pH or high pH. And we're interested, in particular, I've shown a picture here of um, the hail files. Um, this is a, a shot on the left-hand side of the Great Salt Lake taken from um, space. Uh, and the north arm, which can support concentrations of, uh, of cells up to 10 to the eighth per mil. So why halophiles in general? Um, so are there no gamers out here? <laughs> this is to show we at NASA are hip and know about games. Anyway, um, halophiles are not uh, uh, organisms that love to play halo. Um, in fact, they, uh, why are we interested in them? In addition to being extremely um, capable of dealing with high concentrations of salts, uh, they're also able to withstand many environmental insults, including radiation, extremes of temperature, low oxygen, exposure to heavy metals, and um, desiccation. And just to give you an idea of things that we have done, um, we've sent halobacterium into space. This is a program run by the Russians called BioPan. It ran between 1992 and 2007. And this, as you can see in the center, um, the um, module that was actually flown on a Russian satellite, and it contained um, archaea, halophilic archaea from coastal waters. It contained some Denaliella that came out of an evaporite. And over on the um, right-hand side is actually a, um, uh, another archaean in a salt crystal. And these were all placed into um, those wells and uh, sent to space for two weeks and then examined to find out uh, what sort of changes had been observed. So these experiments, or this particular module I'm showing, happened in the early 1990s, or no, late 1990s, at the beginning of the, or midway into the program, uh, well before there were really uh, genomic techniques to be able to observe this. But what we're doing now is actually sending similar sorts of organisms into space uh, and, and learning about what the space environment does to changes in their genome and their um, uh, and both in its construction and mutations and how it actually uh, controls transcription and, and translation. Our newest programs have been EXPOSE, um, which we've been part of. These are mostly, these two were run by um, ESA, which is the European Space Agency, but we're also getting into the business of sending things up to the International Space Station. In this case, this is a, um, a facility, or a, 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 a um, um, compartment that is attached to the balcony of the Columbus module in the International Space Station. And you can see uh, the, actually I can even point to that, I think. So right here you're looking at where these experiments that people have been sending up there are, are actually um, run. All right, so halophiles is a model for extraterrestrial life. What have we learned from omics? So I understand that there are probably at least 200 um, genomes from halophiles that have been sequenced. Um, I use this picture of the, this genome and transcriptome uh, from the fungus to remind me that it's not just archaean and bacterial halophiles, but there are a number of photosynthetic, photosynthetic and heterotrophic and mixotrophic um, eukaryotes that are also halophilic and important to look at. And what have we learned in these analyses? We've learned that one of the ways that they uh, function so well in this environment is they have a high GC content. There's a preponderance of acidic proteins, which actually prevents them from precipitating in high salt concentrations. They have a course in their um, core genome, a, a number of stress response po proteins sort of common to most of the, or all of the genomes that we've looked at. Not surprisingly, since most of the things that they're dealing with are DNA damage, stress, um, uh, um, environmental factors that cause DNA damage. They've got great repair mechanisms. They have a diverse set of metabolic capabilities, and you can find them in a variety of different environmental, environmental conditions. Um, I mentioned there are phototrophic and anaerobic capabilities, and they have complex genetic responses. So we think that, that these are really good organisms and could serve as a model for extraterrestrial life because most of the things that we know about environments beyond our, our planet are, are pretty extreme and, and cover the gambit in terms of these environmental assaults that they can withstand. 
So these are just examples of hypersaline habitats on Earth. This is a, a, a saline lake in Tanzania on the upper left, salt domes in the bottom of the ocean on the upper right, uh, an ocean or a sea uh, beach uh, in, uh, just off of Turkey, uh, and some deep sea brines as just as an example. So these are, you may all be aware of and have seen uh, data from this. But here's another briny situation. This is actually something called a recurring slope lineae. These are found in the equatorial regions of Mars. And what you're seeing in this animation is um, multiple photographs taken of this site that show the appearance and disappearance of these dark streaks coming down the sides of these crater walls. And what we believe, uh, based on some uh, remote sent remotely sensed uh, chemical data that this is caused by um, brines. So you're actually witnessing brines coming out of the subsurface of a crater on Mars and potentially uh, providing evidence of a habitat for, uh, for life on Mars. So NASA is always announcing we found water on Mars. Um, usually it's evidence of past water. We believe at the same time that we uh, began to develop life on Earth. It was a habitable environment on Mars as well. And there's evidence that we had flowing water, there are river deltas, there are basins. Uh, but this is actually the first example of um, liquid water actually at the surface on Mars. And so this is a pretty big discovery. And this we've seen now, now multiple times over many years. Um, and we believe that this uh, is not an uncommon feature. It's mostly equatorial, but we see it in the north and the south. And this is the distribution map of places that we've observed it from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter high-rise uh, images. In addition to that, we know that at the poles that there is um, water ice just beneath the surface. And at certain times, there's uh, temperature fluctuations that can cause um, <coughs> that can cause uh, evaporation or melting of, of, the, um, of the ice. And this is from the Phoenix lander that was uh, landed at the poles, scraped the, uh, the earth with a, a, sh a scoop, and, um, a, a, and uh, uncovered ice that is um, I uh, water ice. Um, you can see where it landed. And one of the most interesting things at this is these are the struts on the lander. And during a, a 24 hour, or actually the day is longer on Mars, but during a Mars day or Sol, you can see the appearance of basically uh, water droplets that are appearing on the strut. So there's deliquescence from the minerals and the, and the soils or the regolith on Mars and providing these micro environments that could support life. And again, the only way this can happen is if there is a salt involved, and so these are briny briny droplets. So I'm going to switch gears from Mars, where we've certainly been spending a lot of our assets looking for life. Um, we believe it's a harsh environment. It's colder. It's drier, at least now. But we have some evidence that we see some water on the surface. And that's been the mantra at NASA to follow the water. So our most recent attentions have now turned to uh, water worlds uh, beside, outside of our planet. So this is a picture of our planet. We've scooped up all the water, and it's represented, the total amount of water on the planet is represented by that large droplet sitting on the United States. This is one of the moons of Jupiter, Europa, and that's how much water it has uh, contained in it. You can see the mass is, is significantly smaller than Earth, and yet it's got something like three times the amount of water. So is this a good place to look for life? It's, um, we think it is. Uh, and how does life persist in an icy body like this? Again, we get back to salts and brines, uh, depressing the freezing point and permitting liquid water to be present. So in general, just to, to um, look at, there's a, an image, and these are scaled, of how much water is on Earth and how much water we think is in the ice-covered moons of the outer solar system. So those are moons around. Um, Jupiter, like Europa, and Ganymede and Callisto, and moons around Saturn, like Enceladus and Titan. And even uh, there's a moon that we think it supports a subsurface ocean around Neptune, Triton, the one on the bottom. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these worlds and what we know and why we think there are oceans and, and why we're very interested in going there next in our, 
in our um, search for life in our own solar system. Um, this is a shot looking at the uh, straight on in the rings of Saturn. And that little body sitting on top of it is Enceladus. Enceladus is about this area. So you can see it, it's uh, not even as large as the Great Lakes area. It's got two sort of features on it that show, um, you can see cratering on the, the northern hemisphere of the moon. And that's um, as a result of um, you know, most of the solar system is being bombarded by various bits and pieces and asteroids. And, and the fact that you see craters on the north and you don't see craters on the south is because we think that there's water activity happening at the south. We think that there's something called cryovolcanism. There's resurfacing. It's basically like a, a big Zamboni coming onto the surface of Enceladus and smoothing out all of the, the pockmarks and craters that you see there. And we believe that that's evidence of, of um, water activity below the surface. In addition to that, many of you may know that we recently discovered um, jets of, of liquid, well, icy water now, particles being ejected from that same region. So this is coming out of those tiger stripes. And we think that, well, and so maybe I should have started out by saying, why do we think that there, what is the process by which you could have a subsurface ocean in these icy planet, uh, uh, satellites? And the reason is, is that these are small moons compared to their massive um, parent planets and the gravitational force between the two are causing the actual moon to flex. And as it, it orbits its planet, it flexes, and that causes friction. And the friction actually melts the water. So it can, can, it can sustain an icy ocean beneath the subsurface ice-covered um, body. And we think that the ice can be as much as 10 kilometers to 100 kilometers. But, but beneath that, there's evidence that there is uh, is an ocean. And again, the strongest one is now coming from Enceladus, which if we look at it now over years, it almost looks like the southern hemisphere is collapsing a little bit, as if it's a, uh, a, a basketball. And as it shoots out materials from its pole, um, it, it, we're actually seeing mass decrease. So we don't have any plans to go to Enceladus just yet, although it's certainly intriguing. It seems like that might be easy access um, to the, uh, uh, well, actually, maybe I'll back this up and say it again. Um, we don't have plans to go to Enceladus, but we do have plans to go to Europa. This is a picture of Europa. It's a moon of Jupiter. And this is uh, an artist's uh, vision of what exactly is going on uh, in that uh, satellite. So you see the subsurface ocean beneath many kilometers of ice. And you see um, convection cells that are actually bringing materials from the ocean to the surface. And this is pretty critical in understanding why we think that someplace like Europa could support life. So the bottom line is that, that Europa is in a, uh, a radiation field um, caused by its, uh, its parent planet. And that causes uh, oxidation of materials on the surface. And so we have these oxidants on the surface. We believe that the core is much like the core of our planet and that there's potentially hydrothermal activity. In fact, some of the evidence that we've gotten back from the plumes that have been putting out this water from Enceladus is that they seem to have a signature that could be hydro as a result of hydrothermal activity. And so you have these reduced compounds uh, from the hydrothermal vents. You've got oxidized compounds. If you look at the, the um, figure on the right, you've got oxidized compounds on the surface. And in the end, Europa can fuel life because basically it sets up a giant battery. And what's critical to that battery, as I said in the model um, that I showed before, is that you need to have, um, let's see, you need to have communication. So it doesn't help if you can't connect the electrodes. So this is why, again, we have evidence that there's a water ocean. We know that there are oxidized compounds on the surface, and we know that there's hydrothermal, or likely hydrothermal activity that would produce, um, produce reduced compounds from, from beneath, from the core. In addition, we suspect in modeling that, again, the only way you can sustain this ocean, even though you have this constant heat input from the friction, from the tidal flexing, 
Um, we also know that you have to have a fair amount of salt, so magnesium or ammonia are present in, in this ocean. And so understanding organisms that could potentially live in that ocean uh, environment are pretty critical. Again, we go back to the halophiles. All right, so I talked about the two most interesting moons for us uh, in our solar system, at least in terms of life as we, we know it. Then there's Titan, which is the second largest moon in the solar system just behind Ganymede. It's about, Ganymede's the size, about 10% larger than Mercury. This is about the size of our, of our own moon. Um, it's deceptively like uh, Earth, and, or early Earth at least. It's got a very thick atmosphere, which most of the moons do not even have an atmosphere. Uh, it's nitrogen rich. Um, there appears to be cryovolcanism, which spawns plumes of lava that are made up of methane uh, or, or, and water and ammonia, which is similar to, um, again, it, it's like early Earth except very cold. It's 170 degrees Celsius, minus 170 degrees Celsius. And so the chemistry and what's available uh, to organisms is very different. This is the only other body in the solar system that has liquid, a liquid feature on the surface. And these uh, features are uh, actually methane and ethane. And it has a hydrologic cycle where methane is the fluid. Normally gases here on our planet at extremely cold temperatures, it's actually a liquid. And does it have water? It may actually have a subsurface ocean. We have less evidence of that. The water that is at the surface is caught up in frozen mounds of, of water ice. Um, these are some additional uh, pictures that were taken uh, of the, the lakes and the seas on, uh, on Titan. There are hundreds of these, and they are mostly been imaged from um, about 50% of Titan's known surface is covered by these, these features, these liquid features. Uh, in addition, the uh, image on the right is from something called Huygens. It was a probe that, as um, Cassini came around to image it, tossed out, and there, it had a, a two-hour lifetime, I believe, as it, it uh, went from the orbiter to actually to the surface, and this is uh, what it looks like. Um, you can see the size. There are these small rocks and small ice crystals. The hills in the background, uh, we believe, are solid, um, basically water, ice, or, or glaciers. So what kind of environment, or what, what sort of challenges does an environment have for life as we know it? So people have worked out a theoretical chemistry that's based on methane and ethane. Um, they've discussed possibilities of energy transduction via acetylene. Uh, there's a lot of chemistry going on in the atmosphere that, co that creates polymers, complex organic polymers called tholins that um, actually microbes on Earth can use some of it, but might be the source of building blocks and, and energy and food. Um, any kind of chemistry you would need would be based on nonpolar solvent chemistry, and we know at least on our own planet, I think I heard somebody said that um, we had one advent of life. I don't know that, that I believe that life arose only once on the planet. We certainly have a winner that we see all over the planet, but I think that there are possible other solutions um, to life uh, that, and, and no pun intended with solutions or solvents, but uh, in this case, there clearly would have to be a different solution to, to life on a planet that required uh, nonpolar solvents and biomolecules that, that were also nonpolar. And so instead of looking at things like DNA and proteins, we start looking at steroids and, uh, and other uh, nonpolar compounds to, to form uh, and sustain structures that can do work and, and create um, uh, physiological uh, machinery. Some of these ideas have actually included self-sustaining, replicating systems with catalytic organic chemistry. And again, um, the key that helps it with something like using these nonpolar compounds like steroids and tholins is that at really low temperatures, um, you're basically well, what I should say is you can make up an organism from these things, and if you warm them up to temperatures on, on uh, the Earth, you'd actually melt them. So we're looking at, uh, you know, basically wax and lard-based um, organisms. Anyway, um, the final thing that I'll mention is that uh, in addition to these options in our own solar system, 
Um, Kepler is a space-based telescope that's been staring at 1 444th portion of the sky um, for several years. Unfortunately, um, it had a reaction wheel problem and stopped collecting data about exoplanets in 2013. But up until that point, they had come up with thousands of exoplanet candidates. A number of them fit into the size uh, of Earth and close to the distance that we consider to be the habitable zone or the Goldilocks zone. And that's defined by, depending on the output of the star, how close to the star uh, a planet needs to be in order to maintain uh, liquid water on its surface. So we think we have evidence of habitable planets. And this is, this is only a tiny portion of the sky. Um, when you look up at the, at the night sky, you're now looking at not stars, but, a, but billions of solar systems, because just about every star we took a look at in that region had at least one planet. Um, so it, it's a game changer. Whether or not we think there are habitable environments within our own solar system, we certainly believe there's a great chance that there are habitable environments beyond. Uh, there was a philosopher, an atomist in, the, in 500 BC that said the likelihood that there is only one form of life in all of the universe is as likely as uh, having a field that you sowed with millet and having only one thing sprout. So I think that we have lots of work to do. Um, turns out there's lots of diversity in the sorts of planets that we have observed, and I can only imagine the diversity in the environments we'll observe as well. And just to uh, get you thinking about what an exoplanet might be like, these are three that we discovered. Uh, in one case, Kepler 16b has uh, two stars. It's a binary star system where your shadow always has company, which is important. Uh, there's a super Earth and a larger mass, the greater the gravitational pull on a planet. And so uh, HD 4307G has, um, um, has some extreme sports possibilities, I guess, for us. And then Kepler 186F is, uh, uh, orbits a red star. And so the grass is always greener uh, or always redder uh, on the other side of this planet. So thank you very much. And so we have time for one or two quick questions. I was sort of wondering if there's any evidence that new life is uh, evolving on Earth. So we have a, nor a single origin of life that we think about, but there are similar environments on Earth right now. Could it be possible there are new life forms evolving? I think it's dangerous to say things aren't possible, so I'm going to say yes, it's possible. You may be referring to something like a shadow biosphere. I think it's pretty clear that the solution to life that we mostly observe has been extraordinarily successful. And in order for us to find anything else going on is going to be very difficult and require very specialized sorts of, of tools. Um, we know how to look for life as we know it. We know how to look for the biomolecules that we're familiar with. If you start looking for things that we're unfamiliar with, it's, you know, that becomes the real challenge. But I think that most people that think about this think that certainly, if not now, in times past when the environment of Earth was very different, both in terms of temperature and oxidation state, that it's very possible that there were a couple of competing uh, origins that may have been, been uh, going on. One more. Hi. You mentioned that the single origin of life theory in, on Earth. Um, what uh, were the conditions like around stars that existed before the sun, and um, would there have been planets, or would those have been capable like, of having, were there even the compounds that we would need, or the, um, like water, for instance, uh, since there hadn't been supernovas or um, proliferation? So I think very metals. early on in the history of the universe, you can see evidence of volatiles, so organics and water. I mean, it's pretty widely distributed. Again, I don't know about exactly at the beginning of all of this, but certainly observations of much older systems and newer systems that we can observe with um, telescopes suggest that 
organics and water are pretty widely distributed throughout the universe. And so I think you had the building blocks definitely there. I think as you look up at the, the sky, you see a range of types of, of stars and their output um, is very important in terms of the ability to support and not completely obliterate light, uh, life. Um, so stellar winds and the radiation that comes off can be really damaging, but it also is what can lead to things like photosynthesis. Um, one thing that's really key and you should be interested in what we're learning about the atmosphere on Mars, and that's one of the reasons we think it's no longer habitable, is at some point in time, so on our own planet, we have a great atmosphere, it sustains water on our surface, and part of the reason that we, we can do this is that we have a magnetic field that deflects a lot of the stellar wind, because the stellar wind has the potential, that radiation has the potential to actually strip away um, atmospheres, and that's what we believe is, has happened on Mars. So at some point, it had somewhat of a magnetic field. It could protect itself. It had an atmosphere. It had liquid water, and it no longer has much of a magnetic field. It has some spot places where there's a little bit of it, and we're observing basically any type of production of materials that could actually form an atmosphere and allow it to actually accumulate gases is almost immediately stripped away by, by the solar wind. So the activity of a star is really important, too, in terms of the potential for, for habitability. So one of the things that people talk about just on a first order or zeroth order analysis is how close you are to your star. So you're not too hot, you're not too cold, and what your size is. If you're very, very large, you can't have a rocky surface. So Saturn and Jupiter are gas giants, um, so they're not habitable. and, and um, you know, in this slide, you see a lot of Jupiter-sized planets around other um, stars. Part of that is a, 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 a um, artifact of observation. It's pretty easy to look at, you know, because the way we detect um, exoplanets is you stare at the star, a planet comes in front, and it just blinks. There's just a tiny little dimming. And so you can imagine the larger the planet, the easier it is to detect. So we have a, a major bias in detection towards large uh, planets and things that are close in because we only stared at the sky for several years and um, we wouldn't have seen anything that was too far out like planet X who you know orbits the, the sun every 10,000 years or whatever that we wouldn't catch that unless we were incredibly lucky so I don't know if that answers your question but it starts no <laughs> <laughs> well, I wasn't maybe you're not sure what your question was but I gave you some more information to think about exoplanets <laughs> Are you now asking about panspermia or something? Because, or no? <laughs> yeah, I think that a, a single origin is something that people, I mean, um, a sign of our not thinking there's a single is that the Gordon Research Conference on the Origin of Life is now called the Origins, um, because the possibility is that there could have been many solutions to life. You know, we've got some pretty uh, broad requirements. You need to replicate, you need to do work, you need to get energy, you need to have some sort of um, you know, vertical transmission of information, and some, there's many sorts of solutions that one could imagine, and there are very energetic and imaginative chemists that do come up with alternatives. So I think that, um, I do think, and maybe this is, I love how I'm dancing around to try to answer your question. Uh, it is possible that if an environment is very different than Earth, that its solution is going to be very different. It's pretty clear as we look at, um, at steps that could have led to the origin of life that reactions were happening naturally, albeit slowly, but there was polymerization. You can get amino acids without having biology. This can happen abiologically. You can even get chirality preferences happening without biology. And so it's almost as if, I don't want to anthropomorphize, but life sort of took advantage of what was there, the materials that were there, reactions that were already happening. Um, you know, life, uh, kind, yeah. So I think if that sort of conditions were different on other planets, you might imagine that the solution is gonna be different and, it, and life might not look anything like what we see today. I mean, take Titan. You know, sit and think about um, what that would have been, what that would take 
uh, to have life and what life might look like then if you found it there. It's not going to look like, you're not going to look for nucleic acids there. That's not going to be what you find. <laughs>